Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, my name is Natalie. I'm the director here at TS1. But uh, more, more importantly today, uh, I am the uh, co-founder of Marca and the host of the Mo one of the hosts of the Mobile Library Project. Um, more information over here on that, uh, on that project. And we're here today to have a panel discussion on archive because this is part of what Marca is, um, a resource center and an archive, and partnering with other people who work in archive. Um, I'd like to first uh, say thank you for, um, to Asia Art Archive for trusting Marca with this valuable project in art education, and as well as uh, the Foundation for the Arts Initiative and uh, Mr. and Mrs. Serge Pun, who so generously help to fund this project. Uh, this is our third event. We spent the last two days at the university. Um, Sanathanan from Sri Lanka did workshops first with the students and then with the teachers at the university. And as we may know, the university education is quite traditional and we felt that we really made a breakthrough with the students and teachers. Today we welcome four practitioners uh, in the field of art and archive, and uh, I'll be introducing them today. But first, let's start with Sanathanan from the University of Jaffna. And as we go on, I will, I will introduce each accordingly. Uh, Sanathanan is um, not only a practicing, a practicing artist and uses archive in his practice, but also a writer and also a teacher. So he was the perfect choice to bring to the university here in Yangon and uh, to experience the students and answer their many questions. So without further ado, there's uh, Sanathanan. Hello. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'm going to present today uh, three of my works, uh, which are using, which I use the archival technique to uh, 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 for artistic production. Uh, I'll start my presentation with uh, reading a poem in Tamil. Periyavelli, periyavelli unne chilivai larinda naal, vappamana kaatru karikum kadalukum ayvisitte. Oriru kakehel, Nirmala vanil parandana, Kachu, Paramanangale vulasi oli, Pidi ekula pitchu, Andridanangal uril kadesinal, Kareki vandom, Alimatum trimbi poichu, Hadarin surian will in the podu, Mandi taladum, Ur karia ule elende, Irevana aichu, Turatil, Utrepanamene, Erindu kondirinda de Engalur, Periavali, Mune, Silvela in the nal. So yeah, it's like um, my these three works actually engage with the uh, experience of displacement. So like 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 in last 30 years of uh, civil war in Sri Lanka, uh, produce a uh, huge number of uh, uh, displaced uh, citizens, uh, and even there are citizens who born in refugee camps. Um, um, uh, so there is no single family in the north and eastern part of Sri Lanka which was affected by the civil war without the experience of displacement. A sense of displacement actually caused by the 30 years of civil war, civil conflict in Sri Lanka is everlasting scar on Tamil speaking community. And also like I, I, I would like to mention that uh, there is no uh, social psycho support for these people to cope up with the post-war situation. Uh, these displacement occurred in different points of history due to the uh, ethnic violence, government military operation, government imposed economical embargo, internal fights between Tamil militant groups and ethnic clearance. These cycles of displacements were drastically alter the earlier democratic patterns and damage the age old so uh, social fabric. So these are the, some of the empty houses. 
most of these populars rapidly replaced. Like this displacement never happened in once. Like it's a kind of a rapid, rapid displacement happen. And so, um, so uh, even a person who's not uh, 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 like changes location due to the displacement have a kind of a sense of uh, sense of strangeness, strangeness or strange of uh, a sense of displacement because its whole na neighborhood change. So we did a we did a we did an artwork in 19, in 2004. It's a kind of an installation called Histories of History History of Histories uh, in the public library in the Jaffna. The, this public library was burned by the government in 1981, and um, uh, so and then it was rebuilt uh, in 2004. So 2004, when they opened the library, uh, the, the renovated library, it opened with an exhibition curated myself and a colleague of mine from South, uh, depicting militarization and civil conflict in Sri Lanka. As part of this exhibition, we put up a uh, show called History of Histories, where we collected 500 objects from different corners of Jaffna Peninsula, uh, which represent or remind their uh, uh, life in that time. It was a 30 to 25 years of war. Uh, war. So it's... Uh, so, and it's showcased in the form of kind of a museum or a kind of a, a laboratory. So these are the objects which we collected from 500 houses. And there is also a kind of a Buddha, Buddha, Buddhist Jataka, uh, uh, yeah, Buddhist, no, Buddha Charita, uh, where Buddha, uh, there one woman, uh, one mother went to, went to ask Buddha to give uh, 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 life to her son who was... Uh, 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 died because of the snake, snake bite. So Buddha asked, uh, Buddha asked the mother to go and collect rice or something from one, any, 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 any house uh, where there is no death occurred. So then this woman went and looked at for that kind of house and she found death is become a kind of a, a story everywhere. Uh, so like that we went house to house and uh, uh, find objects uh, for this exhibition. Um, so, after seeing that exhibition, I got an invitation from Anthropology Museum Vancouver to do a kind of a similar uh, project. Initially, they asked me to shift the whole exhibition to Vancouver, but that time in 2009, uh, the war is in the high, it's in, it's, it, it, that was at peak time of the war and you can't lift these materials because uh, these uh, objects uh, uh, are like uh, uh, identity cards, death certificates, uh, 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 keys of the missing house, uh, uh, demolished houses, and uh, barbed wires, water, ash, that kind of objects. So you can't, we, so it's very highly risk, and also shell pieces and bullet pieces and things like that. So we, it's very difficult to get the government clearance to pass this. So, so we did a, I did a similar project in Vancouver with a diaspora community, Tamil diaspora community uh, in, in, in Vancouver. Um, uh, around 300 individual stories of home. This installation uh, tries to unpack the complexities and liminalities of Tamil home in Vancouver by answering the question of how do the emotional and material boundaries of diasporic home exist and how do they interact and transform each other. So this was a Vancouver exhibition. So we are, here I included uh, so some suitcases uh, through uh, because these objects also uh, when they when they reach when when most of the objects are from Sri Lanka or also they represent objects uh, or replace of objects uh, uh, which uh, with that available in in Vancouver uh, so that also actually there is a kind of a, 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 a thread of uh, travel uh, because uh, the, the 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 customs and the illegal um, uh, illegal travel to these kind of places also uh, monitored and transformed the uh, way in which the object uh, handled or the or kind of object they can take uh, carry with them. So I brought that essence uh, that that um, uh, part also into the insulation. Uh, so in like uh, like uh, in in this kind in both both of these displays actually uh, it's uh, uh, from what we saw it's like uh, it's engage and invite view, viewer to imagine their own home and each mundane objects in the collection while representing a personal history 
or memory of home, construct a collective image of home in the context of uh, displacement. Um, so after seeing these two uh, projects, uh, uh, the Raking Leaves invited me to do a, a book project with them. And initially, we were thinking about reproducing a kind of a work I did in uh, Canada. Then later on, we, we were in the discussion. We, uh, we found that how, how, how we are going to incorporate uh, my own skill as a painter or, or a, a, a work beyond like a kind of a, uh, a curator. Uh, so it's like, um, so then through the discussion, uh, I, we evolve, I evolve a methodology uh, to use uh, how use uh, drawing as uh, uh, as a main medium for uh, for uh, finding out memories or uh, tapping the memories and as well as representing them. So this is called the incomplete tombu, the artist book project, present in the form of a bureaucratic document file contains of 18, uh, contains of 18 documents of civilians displaced from the northern part of the island during the civil conflict between 1983 and 2009, presently living either in Sri Lanka or abroad. This project records the stories that remove, re, remove Sri Lankans, uh, civilians from their homes and the memories that they have took with them. So this is a book. It it's looks like a kind of a bureaucratic file. So well, the meaning of the tombu, mean, the tombu means it's a public register of land. The word tombu is a common word in among Singhala and Tamil-speaking communities in Sri Lanka. It's derived from a uh, Greek word tomb, meaning section, most likely a papyrus, which gave a rise to the Latin word tomb, a large book. Later, Portuguese and Dutch used the term in Sri Lanka for their earlier forms of land registers and deeds. This colonial document, the tomu, talk about the ownership of land in relation with physical uh, boundaries of the plot of others. Book, this book project uh, actually tried to map out the emotional boundaries of the property immediately after the end of armed conflict based on memory. A uh, major challenge of this book was how to present the individual, how to, how to, pres how to present the individual who is not visual artist while incorporating my skills in visual representation. How to transform the forms uh, of an ordinary book into an extraordinary art object. For this purpose, I have chosen a method to collecting the testimonies through the process of memorizing involved with act of drawing. Um, Uh, the project examined the subject of displacement through a series of drawings that over, uh, overlay gr ground plans ho of houses drawn, by the memory, drawn, drawn from the memory by displaced Tamil-speaking civilians with architect rendering and, uh, architect's rendering and dry pastel drawings. The attempt to register or document on top of the other, map out further displacements between what is remembered, what has been taken away, and stories left behind in the conflict that has torn apart its land and its people forever, for over 30 years. So testimonies also varies temporally from 1958 to anti-Tamil riots, uh, and 1958 anti-Tamil riots to uh, 2007 civil war, especially uh, from Mannar to Toronto, Putalam to London, and narrates about family, objects, plants, pets, festivals, and villages. Juxtaposition of these mismatches, on the other hand, produce a surreal location. Similarly, all stories are different in nature. Very few talk about the tragic incident. Some are funny, nostalgic, obst uh, uh, optimistic, simple, and ordinary. There is also a subtext of resistance. However, the overall feeling is a sense of loss. While making the private into public, individual into collective, the book transformed the ordinary as an extraordinary and mandate as aesthetics. The project, the project memorized the common loss in the war. Book come into existence along with the history of uh, abolishment of civil memor memorials associated with the last 30 years of war, bulldozing and vacuum cleaning all the LTT memorials and burial ground, and the mushrooming, mushrooming of government military me memorials and victory me monuments. So far, this is the only memorial in which the voices of the civilians who carried the burden of the war is inscribed. Unlike the installation, the, uh, the form of the book allows this memorial to exist temporally and spatially. 
Further, the combination of artist drawing, architectural map, ground plan, and the text, and the text expand the possibility of multiple reading. By making an individual pain into a common loss, the project uni unified isolated individuals as a community. So now I'm going to read some of the testimonies to just to feel about the book. I was a small child when we displaced in 1990. We walked nearly 15 kilometers to reach Jaffna. My family members carried household things that were portable. Since I was a small, I, since I was small, they told me to carry my, my pet puppy. I carried him because he was too small to walk that distance. A few days after we reached Jaffna, the puppy died. We got, notice a le uh, we got notice to leave our village without delay because of the advancement of government troops. My grandfather could, uh, could not bear it. He died that the same day. Le we left the village immediately after his body was cremated. It is hard to nature jasmine creeper in a heavy winter of, Jaff of uh, Toronto. I covered the plant with a blanket and kept it inside the house. Last summer, it yielded four flowers. Their fragrance brought me back to my Jaffna house. We have to leave our house because of the advancement of troops in 1990. My father carefully looked at the uh, locked the doors and brought all the keys with him, with the hope of return. Now almost 20 years have gone by, and my father passed away a few years back without seeing his house. We still have, a, have the key of the house, even though it and my father no longer exist. Now I am living in Toronto with my family. With my, family. my childhood memories are more, more closely associated with, my, with our house in Shafna. There is not a trace of my house now. I used to see my land from Canada using Google Maps. My father died when we were small. My mother struggled to feed seven children. I started working in a paddy field when I was eight years old. My elder brother, were, who, who was helping my mother to raise the family, was shot dead by Indian Army. My elder sister is married and living in Switzerland. My younger brother is in France. Now I work as a university lecturer in Jaffna. One of my sisters was in LTT Carter and she was killed in 1995, 1995 during a military operation. My other two sisters are married. One of them was badly injured in the last phase of Vanni war. Both my sister's husband lost their feet in the same war. The house that I live, uh, the, the, the house that I live in now come under the air attack in 1990. It was the first night air raid by the government. Everything in the house was destroyed. I lost all my toys that I kept since I was a child and all the glass bangles that I kept in the wooden boxes. I have since, re I have since rebuilt my house, but there is no toys and bangles, to call it, and bangles to call it home. One of my brother was in LTT. Therefore, my whole family moved to Vani during the Jaffna Exodus in 1995. We settled in Vani, but there was there and the war forced us to move again. We only took one, one set of clothes that we could carry in one bag. I am now quite comfortable with this portable home existence because a permanent house can be lost, destroyed, and is the cause of pain. I have resettled in our own house after nearly tw 20 years. Everything has changed here. My street does, does, not, li does not like it did before. Most of those who were displaced have yet to return. Even in the refugee camp, we live with our relatives and friends. Now I am living with strangers. I am a stranger on my own street. Thank you. Thank you, uh, everybody, for, um, uh, for being here. Uh, it's a real privilege to be here uh, in Myanmar. And, um, what I wanted to do over the next 15 minutes or so is just share with you four, um, uh, four stories, four uh, ideas of the archive uh, that um, my colleagues and I at the Asia Archive in Hong Kong have been involved with over the last few years. 
Um, I'm not going to presume that you know what AAA is, so let me just try and... Uh, uh, AAA is a, a physical library, uh, one of the most significant collections of secondary and primary material on uh, recent art in Asia. Second, it is a digital platform onto which are stored a, um, a vast and growing collection of documents, with photographs, uh, manuscripts uh, uh, from writers, from curators, from artists, which are available for free on the internet. And the third leg of the archive is, is sort of research programs, our learning and participation initiatives in which we take things that are in the archive out and then act as invitation to bring things into the archive. So the image that you see behind me is of the Chinese artist Song Dong, who was an artist in residence at AAA. Uh, and as part of his project, he produced a, a series of wall calendars. So the things that you see hanging on that, uh, on that black wall of 36 years of Chinese history. And the opening of the exhibition, he invited uh, audiences from Hong Kong to come and work on top of these wall calendars. So to become participants uh, and in writing their own histories onto these 36 years of Chinese art history. So we are a lot of things. Uh, and before going, getting into my four example, I wanted to introduce the idea of the archive as a, as a constellation of accumulative platforms. So accumulative in that they sort of keep rolling and keep adding to each other. And we, for us, these platforms can be um, uh, knowledge infrastructure. And in much of Asia, knowledge infrastructure doesn't look like Ivy League art history departments, doesn't look like MoMA or Tate Modern. Most knowledge infrastructure in Asia takes the form of independent spaces, of teachers, like we, what we saw at Myanmar and at uh, the National University of the Arts and Cultures, or, or Sanatana, of art writers, of exhibitions, uh, and indeed the archive. A second lens that we apply is particular practices. I won't go into all of them but just mention performance, which I know is also of great relevance to uh, Myanmar. Because in much of, uh, much of Asia, where exhibition spaces, permissions, um, act as limiting factors to what gets displayed and circulated, performance and the artist's body allows a certain uh, currency of circulation. And that, because it's ephemeral, is really valuable to us. So it's one of our uh, focus areas. And last, but certainly not least, is the idea of geography. Because geographies don't go away. Lines may get erased or rearranged, uh, but they still remain lines on the maps. So that was by way of introducing us to what we are and what we do. Now I'm just going to sort of switch into a quick uh, flick through some of the projects. Um, this first I'll start with um, is uh, Salon Natasha. This is an independent art space uh, founded in 1990 in Hanoi. Uh, and my colleague Elaine will talk more about it in a digital archiving workshop that we're uh, holding uh, tomorrow. What I wanted to share with you was how art history, what does art history look like uh, in its naked self? You know. What are the sort of the little things that make art history happen? And I'm going to do this by sharing some images with you. So Wu Dantan is the artist who, uh, who him and his wife Natasha, so the name of Salon Natasha, founded Salon Natasha. But what it was, it was many things, like art itself. It was his house. It was their studio. It was a meeting place for artists. It was a place for exhibitions and it was a window into the society of Hanoi. And each of these images I'll show you uh, will be through the lens of this particular window that looks out onto the street, but then also you can see the street from, from who's looking out. 
So this is in the early 1980s, in 91. So that's Natasha on the right, and you can see Hanoi behind you. This is an opening of uh, Hanoi artists. Uh, one of the important things about this time uh, in Vietnam, of course, is Salon Natasha was one of the few places where exhibitions were not censored because they were, you know, they were a sort of in-between place. Uh, this is not a formal exhibition hall or a gallery. This is a house and a studio. So they could actually sh show things, share things, which would not be in circulation elsewhere. This is m one of my favorites. This installation is done with hangers. He's aged a lot in the 20 years that you see, you see here. And then it changed, you know, as houses change. So if you, if you look over the decades, uh, how the sort of the front sort of changes over time. So this, in a way, is, is the kind of material that is, digiti uh, is digitized, is available on the net, and is available to fuel multiple practices, artistic, curatorial, uh, pedagogic, um, and research. A second project I'll briefly mention, because it deals with performance, is of the um, American, uh, Malaysia, and Singapore-based artist, Ray Langenbach, who many of you, I think certainly in the performance community in Myanmar, will also know, because he is one of the people who almost sort of surgically attached to a video camera, went around most uh, important performance festivals that took place in Southeast Asia for the best part of two decades. Uh, so over these 10,000 hours of, uh, or sorry, 1,000 hours of, of video of these uh, of his performance uh, recordings, of his conversations with artists, of his recording just walking through uh, the streets of where these performance festivals take place have been digitized uh, and are available for, for viewing and research at AAA in Hong Kong. So what kind of things are they? Just this, uh, for example, is a seminal performance in 1995 by uh, Joseph Ng, the Singaporean artist. The, the piece is called Brother Kane, and this is the performance that made performance art illegal in Singapore for 15 years. Um, so this is just a sort of a snapshot of, of what the performance was about. You can find more about it on, on the website. I don't want to get into details of the work itself, but I do want to sort of mention that just last year in Singapore, there was an exhibition held to, of documentation of that performance. And, and, the, um, and this was curated by the artist and perfor uh, performance artist himself, Lu Zihan. You see him here right in front. And what it comprised was material from these archives. So all those video monitors are showing uh, clips and performances from that uh, performance and in that festival. Uh, and that was made a bit, you know, this was only possible because of the archive. You could go back and revisit these moments of history and what they mean at, uh, then and now because the archive makes that possible. So these were two small uh, sort of focused projects of a particular time in a particular place. I want to pull back now in the, in the next two projects that I'll share with you on a slightly wider scope. Uh, this is a project which we, we call sort of informally China 1980s, Materials of the Future. And then over, over about a period of six years, we have recorded interviews with uh, between, well, it's getting close to 100 people now. People I sort of describe as the, the midwives that helped uh, give birth to what we now know as Chinese contemporary art. So these people are curators, writers, uh, artists, Gu Wenda, for instance, or Gao Minglu. Um, and what we've been able to do is uh, have long-form interviews, which are all available in Hong Kong. But we've put up edited copies of those interviews with, uh, uh, with, uh, with subtitles in English uh, and transcripts 
that you can access off our website, off a special website, on a YouTube channel. And um, what is now possible because of this kind of material being made available is that there are a number of universities all over the world, particularly in North America, who are offering uh, contemporary Chinese art courses, uh, where a lot of the source material is actually here on the web. Many of these people uh, that we've interviewed as we develop a relationship then begin to trust us with their personal records because they too feel the responsibility of hanging on to uh, these pieces of history, which is not just their history, but is, is sort of collective memory. So over the years, many of, people, many of these people have shared personal material with us, letters, tapes, videos, photographs of important exhibitions. And we are uh, slowly, it takes a long time to do this stuff, are, are making this material available on the internet. So this, for example, don't worry, you don't have to read this. I just wanted to give you a flavor of the, of the breadth of material that's available. This sort of tree diagram shows the, um, the kind of material that the curator Fei Da Wei has shared with us. So, you know, from his articles, to his artist files, to his role in the Magicien de la Terre, the uh, exhibition at the Pompidou. Uh, he was the founding director of the, the Ullen Center, UCCA. I know the, the, the current director was in uh, Yangon just a few weeks ago, Phil Tenari. So the talks that he held there. So all this material is being made available online. And the last project I'll touch on briefly um, is um, the Indian Bibliography Project. It's ongoing. The red dots that you see are places where we have had researchers who are compiling a list, so that's what the bibliography is, of over 10 and a half thousand texts that have been written on art in 13 languages over the last 100 years in India. Now, I know that this audience is uh, familiar with many of these Indian languages, but just to sort of belabor the point, that these are not dialects. We're, we're actually talking about distinct cultures, dif distinct histories, dif distinct temporalities and trajectories of thought. So in Gujarati, in Tamil, in Urdu, for instance. And what we're slowly combining is, is making this material available as, as a searchable database on, 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 on the web. And what that will do, so once this start material starts coming up, is it asks questions of the received narratives that we get. So for instance, before we were going to these various places, we would go to our expert advisors, our, our sort of the scholars in the field, and ask them, look, we're going to Chennai, tell us the authors that we need to look, uh, look for. And they would give us these names. Six weeks into the project, with a with, you know, hard-working researcher, we find these names. So who are all these other people and what are they saying? And why doesn't their work circulate? Uh, similarly in, in Mumbai, in Pune, these are the artist writers that our advisors informed us of. Here is what we found. And what we've done is just sort of scratch the surface. Uh, but as this sort of material accumulates uh, and becomes available, what we hope to do, and I sort of say this in sort of part jest, is there is a seminal book which is sort of for, for a generation of people defined the, the, the narrative of Indian art. It's called, you know, uh, when was modernism uh, in Indian art? And when you look at these ten and a half thousand entries in Malayalam, in Gujarati, in Assamese, in Urdu, I think what it makes you realize is that perhaps there needs to be a parenthesis added into that title, uh, that that book was really talking about a particular largely cosmopolitan English-speaking modernism. And the book that will talk about modernisms in Gujarati, in Malayalam, in Bengali, in Urdu still have to be written. Uh, I'm going to stop there because we've got uh, running out of time and, and uh, I'll, I'll pass on. But hopefully we'll continue this conversation. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce, uh, last but certainly not least, um, Zasha Kola and Sumesh Sharma, the founders of Clark House Initiative in Bombay, India. They've done a lot of, um, a lot of work with the space itself, but also exhibitions addressing 
alternative histories, um, both in India and internationally. So. Good evening, everyone. It's, it's we're really thankful for being invited to Yangon. Um, we've had a certain. Uh, a, yeah. Hi. You can take it. Okay. I've got it. Thank you. So yeah, hi, good evening. Um, we're really happy to be here. We're here amongst friends. And uh, we're retain, re returning here after two years at the same moment, the same month, and the same days that we were here before. And uh, somewhere we're going to go between the projects and what has happened before that, since 2007. And um, since then, since our last visit to Yangon, which was in uh, October, November 2012. Yeah. So oh, when we got the invitation, we were thinking about archives and how our work and our practice has related to that. But the most recent project we've done with a Burmese artist has been looking at the work of Savan Yongiwe, who was sort of very difficult to find. He's been changing his name uh, many times, and I took permission that we could speak about his work. Uh, over here to you and he's very excited but I don't think he's ever been back to Yangon since he was a or to Burma since he was a baby. He's, he's, he's never been to Yangon and um, it's also kind of a fictional archive his images uh, because it comes out of memory memories of his grandfather and his uh, father he was born in Myanmar um, in the Shan state but since then has always lived in Chiang Mai and then moved to Vancouver and, and Amsterdam and Italy. Um, he sort of had this nomadic life, but the thing is that his own family albums, his own archive, in many senses are the archives of Burmese history or Myanmar history as well. Um, this, for example, is the famous uh, Panalong agreement that happens to be part of his family album because his grandfather was the president of the country. And uh, what's interesting is his take on the minority states, which were part of the Panalong signing. Uh, and he talks about how there's a need for a kind of national reconciliation of all the minorities in these days, which has become even more pressing, perhaps, after uh, Myanmar started opening up up to different kinds of freedoms. This is an abstract painting. He's an artist, um, in fact, had a very Western art education. And this is an event none of us have, would have been able to record uh, or ever see a real photograph of, but it's the event of the assassination in the, in the room. And it's a sort of imagining of that uh, the assassination event. of General Long Sang. If you think about how a video ga game is uh, the kind of viewpoint of the barrel of the gun and how it's placed, uh, yeah. there's a, it's his way of thinking about his family album and also the missing album of Burmese history. Uh, this is from the, I think from the Yangon University where uh, his father and grandfather uh, were both, both there, but this is his father and his uncle who were uh, participating in the theater. Uh, and af I mean, they, he was born in a camp, actually, in a Shan camp. And so this is again from the family album. Uh, this is his father in the camp. And this is some of his representations of more recent uh, images. He's, of course, very much in touch with people who are working uh, in some of uh, the sort of more restricted areas. And this is uh, from 2007. It's his rendering of a very familiar image to most of us uh, uh, that came in many newspapers. And it's, it's how he, he represents that blood stain on, on, the, on the street. And these are his most recent works, which are somehow about the Rohingya and his um, sort of imaginings of, of and, them. And, and in a sense that uh, 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 Sabang looks at himself uh, as a representation of the Rohingya in the sense of uh, being a Shan ethnic person, having to have been in proximity because he was growing up in Chiang Mai just on the border 
um, his father was also going back quite often into Thailand because he was into Burma because he was a part of the Shan National Army. But um, he witnessed Burma from, from a great deal of proximity, but also not there in Burma. It was like this kind of unwritten law, an, unwritten, uh, an undefined border that you know, divided Thailand and the Shan state. And somewhere, uh, the plight of the Rohingya, he felt, was close to his own story, especially the Rohingya children who were affected by the violence that happened against them and their subsequent non uh, acceptance into Bangladesh, you know, where they became people who were uh, tossed as a tennis ball between, uh, between Bangladesh and Burma. Yeah. But, I mean, he also reads his own, when his father died is when he started to go back to Burmese history and, and his own story in a way. Uh, before that, he was very much a West, West using, you know, uh, kind of Western uh, canon. And, and he still uses, you know, images that come from a Western art history. This is a medieval work by Pisano, which he reinterprets with uh, a different context to see the difference in style. So he's also making a, a story about art histories, art styles, and the difference between Western and, and Burmese styles, yeah. and his own displacement. And Samesha often calls this a sort of archive in exile, I mean. Uh, this, this is a Rohingya mother with, uh, with her child. Uh, Sorry. Uh, with her child. And uh, um, it goes back to the, the Mary of Pieta, you know. He's looking at that relationship. And uh, this is a portrait of a Rohingya man, which he makes. Uh, he's never come across the Rohingya. You know, he's never met a Rohingya in... Uh, his, yeah. um, his grandfather used to write a lot of first-hand accounts, and many of those accounts deal with how the army at the time was treating some of the minorities in terms of landmines, you know, using them as human shields almost. Uh, so these kind of first-hand accounts were somehow informing, and, and even what he reads now because he's very uh, in yeah. touch. What was incredible to us was the similarity between these images that Sawang Yongiwe is making now and this uh, image we found again recently last month at the Amsterdam uh, Science and uh, Social, Social Center yeah. for uh, these, Social the, Justice. Uh, so uh, uh, many people know that these were things that were smuggled out uh, of Burma by Wiki and were sent to the. Not um, by but, 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 but with yes, the help of Wiki, and it was sent to the Social History Museum in Amsterdam. And these are the works of Tain Lin, which he made during his prison years. And for us, this was a question in the sense that when we, we did get access to this archive as a part of a museum show that we're curating in Amsterdam. But the ownership of the archive and its use was the question, because in the end, it was, we had to almost pirate uh, digitize these images. These images hadn't been digitized by the Social History Museum in Amsterdam. And these are images that are really important for younger people uh, here in Yangon because they represent a really important history. But if the rights of archiving and the right to these images are not held by the artist and not held by the museum, and the museum um, is lacking in funds because, you know, the, uh, the Dutch government has withdrawn from looking at art as a public good. So what happens? You know, it goes into a kind of an interstate scenario. And so we actually p pirate digitized all these images for the first time and uh, handed them over a, 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 a DVD, but were also able to bring these images back into Myanmar in a certain manner. You know, I remember talking to Tain Lin over Facebook and showing the director that he had given me permission over Facebook to uh, digitize these images. But, yeah. yeah um, these are, of course, just to, I'm sure you all know, but these are uh, the works he made while he was in uh, prison and, and so um, I think the, the image of the man was of an in, maybe a fellow inmate yeah. in the, and um, these are also some of the documents that are um, over there in, in, in the Amsterdam um, archive and that leads us to another archive we've been holding and sort of preserving and it's with us uh, by Sitna Nai, who was a Burmese artist who met Tain Lin in the forests of India and in fact maybe 
had very philosophical conversations, also art historical conversations in the forest floor, you know, literally drawing and speaking about what it is to have an artist's life, you know, what, what is politics within an artist's life. And they were, they, uh, Sitna and I was making these, um, these sort of magazines during the days of the 88 uprising and uh, collecting works by friends. Uh, and he, when he left India uh, in 2011, I think, no, two, yes. When he left India, he, uh, he left his archive of papers with us, which with the help of an FFAI grant, we were able to digitize and document and start to translate. And we, of course, have shared with him the digital copy, and we're holding on to magnificent canvases and, and uh, works like this. Uh, we had an exhibition during the Kochi Museum's Biennale. And uh, the, here, the idea of the archive is that he, would, he refuses to ever sell or place these works elsewhere. He really wants them to return to Burma one day, and they enormous, and they were used during protests, many of the canvases. But um, the, the point is, again, that when it reaches Burma, it needs a place where it will remain open to the public, and he's waiting for that sort of infrastructure opportunity, and I'm sure many artists are This image are is an important image because it shows mothers actually, uh, uh, actually uh, uh, hitting the gongs within the viharas, within the pagodas, and it's about, uh, they're praying for their sons in, uh, in exile. And um, uh, a lot of our own interest within Burma came out of the exile stories of Sitnene and Tain Lin in the state of Manipur. But the entire exhibition was housed within a home, which was also gave refuge to Jews uh, uh, fleeing the uh, Spanish Inquisition. And the history of Cochin being this uh, port of refuge for people coming from Arabia, from Jerusalem, from various parts of the world. And somehow, India losing that space, you know, losing that openness to allow that exile to happen. Um, this, this opens into that home. It's called the Mandalay Hall. Uh, it, was of, um, it was owned by a Jewish family that traded between Mandalay and Cochin. Uh, what you see is a, is, is, um, is a poster painting that was used. Um, it's, uh, that was used by protesters during the 1988 protests in uh, Mandalay. Uh, this is the third uh, copy of it because it was destroyed. Yeah, but he, he made it while in exile, and yeah. it was actually used on, on the streets. And in fact, when we were conserving it uh, for the exhibition, the conservators found a lot of stains, uh, raindrops, bird droppings, and, and we left it on because that's a part of the history of the, the work and only repaired where it had been torn, for example. Uh, and, and this is some of the archival material. This is a book he he made while uh, in, in sort of in a camp on the Indian border and he used to teach uh, elements of art through these books and sort of work uh, with, along with uh, other uh, refugees. And it, was a, it was a people. kind of an art textbook that he created where he taught people how to draw through, it was kind of a reference book and that's the refugee camp that you see in the background. Well, um, that was how, uh, it's the view from there, it's also the border town between uh, Burma and uh, Manipur. Um, it's basically um, a part of his archive, but we asked him to elaborate on, to go into that past, because there aren't many photographs that exist from that period. It was almost one of the first conversations, artistic conversations between Tain Lin, who began his art practice within that camp, uh, on the persuasion of Sit, you know, Sit actually forced him to uh, take on art as a medium. Yeah. Next. Sorry, it's not changing. Uh, this is a work he made much later based on an exa a poem, um, In the Dark, All Cats Are Black. It's a long uh, poem about the future generations of uh, Burmese, uh, Myanmar people. And uh, this, this is just to end. It's, um, we've been working since 2007, maybe, on, on a, in a way, through these conversations. And the final outcome were two exhibitions, one in New York, one in, during the Kochi Biennale, and hopefully very soon a book tracing 
these stories of Tain Lin, Sit Nai Nai, but then how Tain Lin re returns and his friendship with Zaganar and Chawi Tain as well. And in a sense, while talking about a political history, we're actually talking about an art history of the development of performance art. This is a particular scene from a film called Top Knot in Burma, where uh, uh, Zagana on the right requests Tainlin to make a, a scene for a, his film, which he's directing. And Tainlin from prison writes this scene, uh, and it's, there's a sign that says, Fruits of Hope. and. Uh, these three uh, performers, they walk down the street uh, shouting, come buy a fruit, how can you resist this? And we, we can't even resist it, with, which is why we have these baskets on our, on our head. And, uh, um, it's and, and it's also like uh, when, when we were deciding upon what we would talk here in Burma, uh, when we would be invited to Yangon to speak for the mobile library, um, we became accidental archivists of various important documents that relate to uh, Burmese political history and the art history. Um, it came out of our, uh, um, you know, our efforts in exhibition making, and a lot of this was left to us by Sitna and A, Tain Lin, and many other persons, uh, e including Savang, uh, where Savang actually is creating this artificial um, memory of, you know, drawing from the archives of his family, while Sitna and A actually has a very detailed um, collection of um, articles that he collects over, uh, you know, more than 20 years while living in exile in India, or, you know, Tain Lin's constant run-ins with, uh, you know, coming back to Burma or leaving Burma. And these archives stand, and what kind of responsibility do we hold for something that is so essential uh, to the Burmese public, you know, where somewhere their ownership also doesn't uh, only remain with the artist, but to um, a larger question of its uh, accessibility to the people here. Also, where, because today it sits in Bombay, where only a few are concerned with what happens in Myanmar, except for, you know, the resources the Indian government can, uh, you know, capture. But rather than how do we find this uh, archive to actually return in which form and how it is, um, it, where, where does it, you know, what kind of conversations actually emerge out of these archives is important because they are distinct from each other. Savang's view or Tain Lin's view or Sit Nain's view. These are distinct conversations, you know, uh, and also political opinions about how they see contemporary Myanmar. And, yeah. I'm just uh, flipping through stills of different performances that feature in the book. Uh, and uh, the uh, previous one was uh, work by Tain Lin, which was a recording that had been maybe forgotten for 20 years, or rather hidden preciously, and then only returned to him much uh, in 2012, I think. And we, we screened it for the first time. And some of these materials um, were also generated by that exhibition. It was the only city in which we could uh, have Sit Nai Nai and Tain Lin at that moment uh, meet each other, and it was a meeting after 25 years. And we recorded this conversation between Chao Ithain, uh, Tain Lin, and Sit Nai Nai. And to us, it is an archival document in itself, the video recording and their re-meeting af after all these years. And it's incredibly funny and also gives a sense of the philosophy which drove not only their political work, but their artistic work. And this is a film by Zagana, which the exhibition began as a kind of homage to him while he was in prison. And by the time we were able to make the exhibition, he, he was out of prison and there were so many uh, changes and he was able to make a film for the exhibition. So um, that's it. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. One thing I wanted to just say briefly in the introduction, and I missed the chance, was um, I was doing my own research in Mendeley at uh, Ludu Archive and Library, which is one of the few examples of the cataloging of history and really paying attention to not only the archive, the physical archive itself, but the memories of people, the personal collections of people here in Myanmar, both uh, with political, uh, within political context and historical context. And I found um, the, a, a book that was covering the 1955 conference held in Rangoon, 
called Cultural Freedom in Asia. And it was all the transcripts of the speeches of speakers from, from Pakistan, from India, from Sri Lanka, Hong Kong, China, also from Myanmar, talking about what, what does it mean for our future? Uh, how do we establish a cultural identity? And uh, what's interesting about today is that we are talking about archives, but it also has to do with what's happening in the present, how artists collaborate together using that archive, and how every artist has a personal collection that relates to something much greater. Maybe uh, start with uh, Sana, because you are our first, bringing it back to your personal practice, how you use archive and war and memory in your artistic practice. Why is it... Uh, what, what do you feel it achieves, or does it need to achieve anything to talk about these through an archive, to create a publication, to work with various artists, but also use your own artistic practice to create this object of, of memory? I think that's such a question. What, what, what's the significance? Uh, to you personally yeah I like I have been working with this uh, like uh, the issue of home because that become a kind of a, uh, a, a most troubling thing in the whole history of war so I have been working uh, with an uh, with that that uh, as a kind of kind of a concept uh, but what I found is like it's like it's in a personal level I'm just dealing with my own painting and uh, my collages and all these things are dealing with that but uh, in the collective level, I found the people also having similar kind of images, which cannot they could, cannot be able to articulate in a kind of a, a way that they can communicate with the others. So these projects actually having that uh, possibility of uh, of uh, talking with them, yeah, that's true. So in that case, I think these three projects are very important to me. Like uh, it's in a way I'm my my story is also there but my stories are appearing through their stories. Yeah. That's, that's something that uh, you, you also have found collaborating with these three artists in exile, mm. that, they, that their, work, uh, their artwork works together, their archives work together to tell a story. Is that one of your, one of your jobs uh, in... Um, I, I suppose... Uh, they work together, but it also makes me think of what Hamad said about 13 uh, languages, that when you, you know, this is a question Savan raised to me, I mean, I, I'm still thinking it through, that uh, while I was in the process of writing this book and trying to stitch it, all these archives together, he said, you're only telling one story, though. There might be several minority stories of art and other art histories that we don't even know of because we don't have the material or we don't have the archive, we don't have the experience somehow recorded or available. Uh, and how, you know, in a way, anytime you tell a story, it's also pointing to all to, uh, the untold stories. And I, I think uh, to us, that idea of a complete story is something that we're, we're far, far away from, you know, and, and we really need to seek the stories now. It, it's not going to come to us uh, so easily. And we, uh, and, but that, that's a normal part of curating, hopefully. But to, to remember that maybe we're telling a more predominantly 88 story that goes through, you know, a particular well-known uh, political moments, but there are these other hidden political moments, and there were kind of art histories developing around them that we don't yet know of, and so. Um, I, I really would like to go back to uh, Sanathanan's uh, presentation, which I felt was, uh, um, it had to deal with a lot of emotion, you know, when, it, when he talked about that poem, and also this idea of going into exile. I'm sure all of the artists from Burma who actually moved into India and other places 
felt those very emotions, you know, when, while dealing with their, the histories of, you know, not being able to be there for their mother's funeral or never to be seeing their father's face again. Um, you know, there's a saying by Luis Sepulveda when he says that, uh, you know, people without a memory are a people without a future. Um, if you go online on Google and you uh, Google just Rangoon, uh, there will be many, many blogs, many, many videos of people just pouring out talking about their memories. You know, this could have been people who were, um, you know, who were a part of the exodus of Chinese and Indian people who were actually, uh, uh, who were actually, uh, uh, you know, expelled from uh, Burma uh, when Nivin took over uh, in the 1960s. And all these people become uh, these, these archives of memory. You know, there will be an exaggeration or an erasure of their memory, but people always go upon thinking about their past, about their families, about the homes that they lived in. And sometimes when I read these blogs, I can imagine how Yangon might have been a, a multicultural Yangon in the 1950s or 40s, what was happening on the 34th Street, you know, how people went about uh, with their lives. And I feel it's very important that, you know, efforts such as uh, 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 Sanatanans, where it goes into the personal memories of people, which is not uh, always seen as an academic resource. And uh, uh, Tianlin might also know this, and you know, it happened with SIT. Uh, most of our conversations were uh, conversations that always dealt with the personal, where they talked about their mothers, you know, and that's also where we wanted to highlight that painting where the, we saw the mothers actually, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, banging the gongs in the temples. Because I feel these emotions of exile become really important uh, references to history. And for young people who have not been given access to that history within textbooks, for them to understand um, uh, much easier the history of a nation could happen from these... Uh, yeah. Would you encourage young people who are just in, in the midst of building their own histories and archives, would yeah. you still encourage them to go back into, their, in, into, into other personal experiences but their own? and use archive as a method of making or as a conceptual I, I think uh, it is the most natural thing that people would do that, you know, we would like to hear music from the past, we would like to uh, dwell in, I, I would encourage them, you know, because I do that myself, but uh, I, I haven't really critically thought about the... Uh, uh, stretch? No, it won't. That's okay. Um, in, in fact, if you actually look at, uh, closely at much of the art that circulates internationally, particularly on circuits that like to think of themselves as critical, so the biennial, the museum, I, I would sort of I would state that the archive is the dominant form of artistic practice today. Um, and actually, I just want to bring it to uh, some audience members, maybe uh, Yadana and Kolat, you guys work with New Zero and you have this archive. And actually, I think, I think most of the artists here have, have worked with the New Zero archive or are in the New Zero archive. Is that, is that a big influence for you uh, in your own work and looking at other artists in Myanmar archive? Oh, and Nora as well. I didn't see you. I think it's uh, always good to look at the history and learn from them. And uh, what New Zero do is just like studying and progressing, the, collecting the uh, what what we being like a Myanmar Myanmar art history is. I don't, we have like not a limited places to learn, so it is like it's really helpful. I think that and we are we have a lot to learn, so. So, so, Samish, can you tell me the name of the artist that you mentioned? I, I couldn't hear the name of the that you showed us. Savang Yonghiwe. Savang Yonghiwe. Savang Wongse Yonghiwe. Yeah. So, for example, I I don't know him, so so it is really helpful for me to know that. Thank you. I, I, just, I had a little question about um, ownership, I suppose. Uh, because you talked a little bit about the artists that use their lived histories, personal histories, and also the artists that use their almost 
in printed history of their, mm -hmm. their families. And there seems to be quite a distinct difference between artists who uh, go through an experience and artists who um, uh, almost have a virtual experience. Um, and so that means that necessarily happens with people that access the digitized archive. Um, I just want you to talk a little bit about what those, has there been any kind of problematics of ownership that you've, um, that you've encountered through artists dealing with histories that aren't necessarily their own? I think there are a number of questions in there, and maybe if I can sort of unpack them and tackle uh, the one at a time. Um, and I think the first one I'll tackle is this idea of um, artists, or and artists don't have to be visual, writers in particular, um, I think are adept and actually most truthful um, when they are using elements of fiction, um, when they're imagining, when they are projecting, um, um, or, or remembering through others. So I think this idea, uh, I, I, I'm, I won't agree with this idea that there is somehow a difference in the valency or validity of lived experience versus imagined experience or uh, heard experience or hallucinated experience. I think they're all um, equally valid uh, in terms of, of, of a search for a narrative. In terms of ownership, um, um, I think this is a vast and, and vexed question. Um, and I'll sort of try and sort of start, and I'm sure everybody will have, have different, uh, different perspectives to add. Um, you know, archives, as, and I think as you have probably felt in the um, Sumesh and uh, Zasha's presentation, um, is not just a source, uh, but it's also uh, an enormous res responsibility. Uh, and the responsibility is about uh, not just preservation, but about communication, about circulation, about making sure, or at least trying to make this material um, circulate uh, and be available for others to tell their stories. So then the ownership issue becomes about, you know, who owns it? Is it owned by the person who gifts it? Um, is it owned by the person who receives it? Or is it some form of a collective ownership? Uh, is it some sort of a commons uh, that we need to, uh, to think about uh, in, into this material? Um, it's, of course, uh, linked with ideas of law, of copyright law, and these regimes change and are changeable. But I think what's also interesting is, as, as uh, some, uh, the Clark House Initiative Project illustrated, that even you know, the law sometimes uh, you know, will look the other way, or you will, you know, be, be, be circumvented and be productively transgressed when it becomes ideas of collective ownership. I'll, I'll, I'll sort of stop there. Uh, I'm, you know, I, 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 sometimes my conversations with artists are very, um, are very banal or, you know, very basic in the sense of why do they um, take on a certain aesthetic or a certain manner, mannerism of painting. And uh, Sawang and me were having this conversation about uh, uh, contemporary painting in Myanmar. Uh, Sawang is a man who's obsessed with uh, Myanmar and about Yangon, many places that he's never visited, many artists that he's never met, but has, you know, trolls the internet uh, looking through images of like contemporary uh, Burma. And, um, and we began talking about Western classical painting in which uh, Sawang was trained. You know, he went to a really important school in Canada, he was living in Italy, and he said that he took on a very conscious decision to paint in a Western uh, uh, classical, uh, you know, realistic style. And he took on that, ex uh, that, 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 that aesthetic so that there's a certain um, idea of authenticity to his imagination, you know, because obviously it's not a lived experience for him, uh, like he was not there during the assassination of uh, General Long Sang, or he was not uh, 
present on the streets of Yangon, but he paints with a certain kind of integrity, um, and he, you know, he adjusts his aesthetics to that integrity, you know, working uh, with something that has been, um, which is readily available. When you see those works, you might imagine it to have a kind of resonance with the Pieta or the Last Supper, you know, where, uh, and, you know, and is getting a kind of, uh, you know, uh, you know, this kind of authenticity to that fiction using this aesthetic. So, I, th th that's just my comment to what you asked. In, yeah. No, I mean, I think the interesting point you raised is also that of illegality and the law and ownership. And with the archive, this becomes central. And I think it's one that with every instance needs to be re-questioned. And sometimes the illegality is more uh, valid and more moral, morally valid than the legal. In, in many cases in which we, we've found and work, not just with Burma, but in India and, and artists across. So it's difficult to give a statement on it. It's rather a condition that one is a situation which one is always somehow trying to negotiate. And, and Tindin's work is an example of it. You know, how you, how you convert the system has been very important to the way we work at Clark House. And in a, many senses, I think our curatorial practice is informed by these artistic practices that convert between systems. You know, you have a legal system, a formal system, but then sometimes you need to uh, undo it, unfix it, change it, uh, bribing the warden, in this case, to remove paintings is a very courageous and, and brave uh, and morally valid act um, that goes against the law, because the law somehow is only meant for a few people, and there are many people who do not fall in the law. And we were just speaking about the Rohingya, for example, and I think just yesterday it came in the papers that they're not allowed to vote this, uh, this present next election. So how valid is this law which we're born into or these systems? So the idea of converting systems or you know, exchange relations between systems is very almost the starting point of many of our curatorial, what we consider a curatorial starting point. Uh, yeah, it's like I just wanted to add what you said actually. I, most of the thing I also share kind of similar issues. Uh, but it's also like in terms of uh, memory, in terms of archiving the memory, I think that the method we are using is also very important. And it's also like, uh, so in that case, it's a kind of a collaborative project in the way, in, in, in any way. So it's like the authorship, whether it lies with the person who's using the method or a person who's in, so that is in the question. But um, what I found is also uh, like, uh, like uh, Hamad mentioned, that different kinds of stories exist. So how we are going to use different kinds of method because whatever you like, uh, yeah. So in like in my project, like um, yeah. So this uh, these people I interviewed, like uh, they were. It's, 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 it, this was not the first time they were interviewed because for various reasons, for compensation, for government reports, for NGOs, militaries, and all these people interviewed them, and they were expecting some compensation from these interviews, and so they also you know uh, embroiled their memories according to their need. So when I went, so first time they were like they were clueless that uh, so what I am going to do, and first time they. Have, seeing an artist coming with a, this kind of a project and so it's like um, so that's what I used uh, drawing as a method actually what I asked them to draw their ground plan so while they are growing drawing ground plan they didn't know what they are trying to what I am trying to looking for then after that while drawing they said oh this was a bedroom this this happened and this was a garden there we were playing so this kind of memory so I was interested in that kind of memories not about the, 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 the memories which are related to paying compensation so later on they found oh my god this is my house this is the thing so they started identifying that with the image so I think so methods will become very important in that yeah so we can't use the same method so when we use the uh, like uh, so that uh, if you use a kind of a different kinds of method for different kinds of memories I think then we can easily tap those things then the, uh, the authenticity and all these things comes into play yeah it's uh, uh, there's also this element of lamentation which is interesting where people also lament with memory and experience and sometimes lamentation is an exaggeration but it also is a very valid emotion that people feel I remember being in New York in a, in a, in a small vihara, like a Buddhist vihara that uh, Tain Lin uh, took us to for a lunch. It was, I think, so the Burmese New Year or something. And I met a lot of people who hadn't been to uh, Burma in 30 years or 25 years. Or 40. 
and a lot of them were lamenting uh, their past, you know, lamentation and kind of deep grief in some senses. And you know, when I, I when I when we are in Paris, we live in um, uh, a district which is uh, entirely populated by uh, Sri Lankan Tamils, and I often visit the temple in that space. And the fact of lamentation is almost an aesthetic, you know, of like lamenting. You know, like uh, if you look at the Jewish people, they also lamented for many years of, you know, wanting to go back to their promised land. And, you know, it became a part of their uh, daily ritual. And even in Paris, in, our, in the temple, the Hindu temple, it becomes a daily ritual. And it's interesting how, how this becomes a part of a visual historical memory because now we have an entire generation of adults living in France who, are, uh, who have never been to Sri Lanka, you know, who have never been to Jaffna, but have a certain visual memory of that space. And it's interesting how they are also creating theatrical practices, theaters based on the exodus, you know, all of that, which is, uh, which is interesting. And I felt that even a lot of the Burmese were doing that outside. Like, for example, if you go to uh, Pahar Ganj in Delhi, uh, there's a large population of Burmese who are born in India. You know, there's a huge Burmese community that lives in almost a, something that you would call a slum. But it's amazing how um, they all uh, re reunite to um, narrate their memories. And I really find it uh, something that's very powerful, you know, those memories. I think so that's an amazing comment that you made because I was thinking about that when I saw your presentation, you know, about when you saw the bo bottles, you know, where there's a key or there's an identification card from Jaffna. Now, these, all these objects have no real um, use uh, for these people. They're never going to go back to the home to open that door. And then when you give it to an artist to use it as a part of his installation, um, do you also suddenly come to terms with that loss, you know, and so you give it up and give it a new life because you've always wanted a new life for that key. You really want it to go in and open a door, but it's never going to open a door. So, so Nathanan, what do you have to say about it? You know, when people hand over ash and water or, you know, many personal objects, you know, which uh, tells them about their homeland. But it's also yeah. a loss of hope then, yeah. no? Yeah, I have two different experiences with these two exhibitions, actually. The first exhibition, uh, when we went, actually, it was a kind of a play. I was teaching conceptual art in my class, and that time only this exhibition, the, 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 uh, the library exhibition coming. So uh, this was done by me and four of my artistry students. Um, so we, we, we took it as a kind of a play. It's not, we, are not, not, we didn't knew, really know the seriousness of the problem. Uh, so when we went and then only when we started talking, we thought we just, uh, we were thinking very, in terms of very material, we'll collect materials from different people. But when we asked for material, they started you know, crashing in front of us, started crying and spending hours and hours to talk, uh, talk to us. So then we found, we are meddling with something very, you know, problematic. Then, um, so when, so 500 objects, so, now, so if you ask me, like even after six months, I can tell you the stories behind each and every object. But we didn't have a kind of a method to document those things. Slowly, slowly, we also started forgetting that. So by that time, it, like, uh, war aggravated, and I have to move from the country for my higher studies. So it, everything was in a box, and we didn't have a kind of a track record to return that. 
it, for them, it may be a kind of a simple object. For us, it's somebody's memory. So we can't throw that out. So it was lying in my house for uh, years and years. So in that, like, when I left India, I handed over that to my friend. Uh, then I told him, see, then I, even I informed my family, if the army entered for a house check, then I will be arrested because I am, whatever it's, 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 it's in under the Sri Lankan law, under, under the emergency, whatever the things which you can't have it, I'm having everything now. So I told them I may be in trouble, but I have to take this risk see, because I can't throw this away. But when I left, I told my friend the same thing, but I told him, but you take a decision according to your own context, there's no need to, because that person is not collecting, he's just supporting me. So when I left, he had he gone through the same cycle, then what he did was, he took out all the objects uh, from the bottles and he buried it. Now it's buried. Uh, but he still he can dig it and do a kind of archaeology and take it out. It's all in, put it in polythenes and bury it. So that, so that actually, that incident made me to be, you know, be careful with these objects when I did in the Vancouver. And Vancouver I did it with a, like a kind of very professional museum. So we, they signed all the, we signed all the consignment papers with the people and we took these things and we, they, we go, go, gone through the kind of very legal processes. And uh, after this uh, project, we return all these things and we had a party and we return all their stuff to, back to them. So it's very interesting in Vancouver, that museum, the Anthropology Museum is not having any Sri Lankan, they, they have some Sri Lankan objects, those are related to uh, some, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, some anthropological objects related to mask and that and this and all. But, but they also found, they also felt that uh, they are not represented in the museum. So this is, they are getting a kind of a chance to represent their identity and things like that. So the, the, the way they approach the exhibition and the way the, the, the Jaffna people approach the history of histories is totally uh, different. And um, so in the end, the, uh, I was there for you know, facilitating, facil facilitating the whole exhibition. And after one, one and a half months, I have to, I have to come back. And they were the one who did the display. They were the one who took the photographs in front of the objects. So I think that is very fantastic. And also like uh, that 200 people, most of them are disconnected because, uh, because of the lifestyle of the Vancouver. They don't know each other. So this project, through this project, they found their own you know, neighbor, old neighbors, friends, and things like that. So this is a different kinds of project, yeah. I think what that's also a great example of is that transition between a personal memory and a collective memory. And if you then think about the purpose of, um, of memorials, of monuments, you know, if, if you think about them as um, uh, promises from the past to the future, um, it, it's about you know, who builds them, um, when do they get made, uh, and then who goes there, and what purpose do they serve. And if you think about those as, again, a, a type of infrastructure, a different type of infrastructure, one could argue that archives, uh, physical or digital, are also this kind of a monument um, that, that is then sort of collectively built and collectively used. Yeah, I just wanted to add something very contemporary because in Sri Lanka, the celebration of uh, the LTT hero day, Heroes Days is banned. So you can't, so like, like from 28th to 27th, this is the time for that and uh, it's banned and it's, it's also during the monsoon session and during the FTG time it was a very emotional, you know, uh, 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 like a kind of ritual they, they made and uh, there were burial grounds all over the Tamil east and east, uh, east, north and east part of Tamil areas but um, after the uh, government capturing these areas it's totally everything bulldozed and they were watching uh, whether anyone celebrates that, even the university was enclosed and all, all kinds of things happen and army presence is very much visible and all that. So this year, so we have a newly elected government that agriculture minister informed last month. Uh, so during the LTT time, they also had a kind of ritual. So whoever go to that celebration, they will give you a plant to go and plant in your garden. So it may be a mango tree or coconut plant or whatever it is. So they, what, what they did was, they said, the agriculture ministry, the local agriculture ministry said, this is a monsoon season, this is for that month for planting trees. So they, re, they reinvented the ritual and they are issuing free plants for people to plant. So the government can't stop it. So how the memory operates. So they have the similar things operating. Like, so this, the whole ritual turned into something else and says, says, the remembering, remembering is happening in a different level. Yeah. There's something that I'd like to, um, when, you, when you meet with migrant communities in the sense of, uh, um, can I say something? Yeah, just one second. You know, I was, 
Yeah. Now, I was just thinking about um, uh, when you deal with migrant communities, especially like if you see uh, many diasporic communities that um, have a sense of hopelessness in the idea of in the near future of returning to their uh, lands. And this is also something that is felt by illegal immigrants, in the sense who are non-documented immigrants in Europe or in America. They're always trying to recreate um, uh, you know, these visual memories in, the kind of, in their daily life. For example, um, when, uh, you know, I really feel all throughout South Asia, uh, shop boards, you know, shop sign boards are these really ugly digital uh, prints, you know, which they print and flex and put outside. Uh, and something that really, um, you know, pains me when I see these uh, digital signs of these shop boards. Uh, uh, but when, when in Paris, um, when you go to the Tamil Quarter, it is entirely these uh, digitally printed out shop boards all throughout. And it's not that they don't have access to uh, these interesting, sophisticated materials that is available to other people uh, in Paris. They're using these ideas. And, and then you go and see like amateur filmmaking. You know, today I was talking to a, a filmmaker out here. And um, there's an entire amateur filmmaking uh, uh, practice in Paris with young, uh, uh, young uh, fr French-born Chameleons who are working with this idea. And I always wonder about what their memories constitute, because they have no memory of that land, you know, they have no experience of the war, but, you know, this kind of narration that comes, and this reinvention, which he talks of, is really important that it can also come through restaurants, you know, like immigrants express themselves through the aesthetics of the restaurants that they run, you know, it's, uh, yeah. Natalie, there's one question I want to ask you in the sense of that, you know, you've been questioning us and I'd like to question you, you know, there's, uh, um, how do you deal with uh, the various histories that you come across of, uh, you know, artists who, like in the sense that when you have to, for example, relate Ong Mir's practice to Tain Lin's practice and then look at what Yadanar or Nora or, you know, Kolat are doing with performance and like a person who is very integrated within the Yangon art scene but also uh, has the uh, lux you know has the um, luxury actually I could say of being the outsider and how are you able to uh, um, then convert that into exhibition making within TS1? chronologically, but also who talked to one another, who saw whose performance, and how did that influence them later, and, and brought in the political histories and these kinds of things as much as I could. Uh, but my, I have so many limitations. Um, and I, I also came from a program which told me uh, where my limitations uh, lied in my, in my Western education and the sort of outsider looking in. That was very important. I also don't read Burmese, so I'm missing an entire chunk of, of research and understanding. Um, but I, I, did, I did find that conversations, photos, videos, I mean, this, was, this really inspired my interest in the archive. Speaking to these artists and seeing, uh, just pulling out a laptop, or they gave me a CD or a DVD with, um, with all their collection on it, and uh, left me wondering why I couldn't find it anywhere. There wasn't any way to access it besides having these conversations, which you, which you know from being here. Um, so I think it was just, a, a, for me, I'm just still very much in the learning process. I wouldn't know how to contain it or from which angle. I feel I won't know that until um, I'm at the end of my, of my research days here, which I hope are I hope don't end any time soon. But do, do you think it's important for a tree diagram like what um, uh, uh, our friend here showed 
of like Burmese, like it's, it's really important because at some point when Zasha and me were going to, uh, you know, work on the project in Kuchin with Tain Lin, we had to do almost three or four, uh, you know, very m miniature survey exhibitions to actually tell the audience in India what was happening in, uh, in Burma and why uh, that's so big. And you were dealing with um, exiled artists and yeah, one, of, yeah. one of my limitations when I came, because I wanted to publish and I wanted to return, was I footnoted politics in my thesis, in my research complete. I didn't mention it and I didn't, I didn't want to get anyone in trouble. I didn't want to jeopardize my own uh, ability to come back. So that's something that I haven't really touched on until now. But what I am doing now is my research is going back to this, uh, there is this 14 year period that people are always referring to as a kind of golden age.